TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, man. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Um, I do not glorify sensationalize or condone any of the facts and stories told. I am here simply to educate myself, others, in the history and the current state of issues around the world. The following presentation is intended, may be intended for mature audiences. It contains graphic descriptions of crime scenes and adult dialogue and strong language. Viewer discretion is advised. Just want to put that out there before we get into it. You know, when we on Socially Criminal, you know what time it is, man. W Channel, one of the best channels, man. <clears throat> Only thing Socially Criminal, if you ever see me, please. Y'all should put uh, UK gang documentaries on here, too. Or make another channel for them. I don't know how you're able to post these, but... <laughs> so, um, don't forget we are a partner with the Respect My Blueprint podcast, man, and the Blueprint Breakdown. Um, this is the channel. These are the videos, and this is the group one right here. Um, there should be another one coming out soon. Um, link link to this one is down in the description though. And if you're looking for any of my old content, it is over here. Remember, you see this in the corner under me. No, you don't. Let me move. Let me move. Let me move. Let me show you. It's popping over here. 850 other people reacted to your reel. Come on now. Hey, I salute. <laughs> I salute it. You know what's crazy, man, about social media? So I got, so you guys here on YouTube, y'all won't go to other places. Like, some of y'all will, but most of y'all won't go to TikTok. Y'all won't go on Instagram. Y'all just stay strictly on YouTube. And I'm just really now getting it. I get it why y'all don't be like <laughs> going other places. So to combat that, what I've done, right, on TikTok, I do a completely different thing than I do on YouTube. So people on TikTok don't really know I have a YouTube. Like, it's crazy. Like, people, on, like, nobody know Each, each... One of these platforms, I'll be doing something different. It's cool. That's that's the point I'm trying to say. Anyway, battered, stabbed, and starved. UK crime documentary. Let's get into this one. This looks suspicious. I already liked. I'm already subbed. Don't forget if you're watching this video in the in the premiere, man, you're a first responder. And I appreciate y'all for being here in this premiere because you can't skip, you can't fast forward, you can't do none of that. So hit the like button, man. Show some love, man. My goal for this video, 150 likes, man. That's light for y'all. That's light. That's, I'm talking overall. First responders, y'all get it how y'all live. I know y'all go show the love and support that y'all supposed to because y'all just being here is in the premiere is lit. <laughs> this time, 35 years on, and still Britain's biggest unsolved missing person inquiry. There's still no sign of the London estate agent, Susanna Lampluth. Susanna left her office in Fulham in West London at 12.40 on Monday. Susie Lamplew. Her car was found abandoned at 12... I feel like, okay, I know this is serious, I've not, but I've seen this in phone jaggers. Like this story. 12.40 on Monday. Susie Lamplew. Her car was found abandoned and unlocked in a street near the River Thames. The prime suspect, who's not what he seems. Financially and career-wise, I've achieved what I've wanted to achieve. This is someone who's literally pretending to be another person. So this charm and intellect seems superficial. He's faking it. I'm just now looking for what the next thing to achieve. But he's kind of overshooting it a bit here. And I see that a lot with psychopathic personalities. And later, the other side of domestic abuse. She's trying to project a gentle, meek, mild, vulnerable individual when the truth is she's an aggressive... I can tell that's already going to make me mad, this one. <laughs> a lot of that goes on. Violent. Like... I sat there and watched the whole pre No one cares. My name is Michael Barley. In July of 1986, I was a detective sergeant at Fulham Police Station uh, and got assigned to the Susie Lamplew case. 
28th of July, 1986, Susie Lamplew, 25, an estate agent, leaves her office at midday, her diary recording an appointment with a Mr. Kipper. She's never seen again. Susie's Fiesta was parked here, but just over the entrance to this, this garage. It was almost obstructed the entrance. The boot of the car was about here. And, and it's part facing that way. But the, the driver's door was unlocked, and so there was a hat on the back parcel shelf. The handbrake was off, and you could see in the driver's door pocket that there was something which turned out to be her purse. Those sorts of things just thought, this isn't right. So she got snatched out the car? With 100 officers assigned to the case, and an Oh man, don't forget we do have Patreon. Pit man, hold on. Dang. Investigation that spread from London to the continent. The hunt for Susie dominated the news for months. The vivacious young estate agent is- Sorry Susie, this is my fault. I should have did this in the beginning. I, it just skipped my mind. Um, my bad, Joe. My bad. This is the Patreon for anybody that's new. Link is down in the description. This is everything that's on there. And I got two new, two new shows beginning real soon. This is England and one other one. Uh, I forget. But let's get back to it. No more interruption. It's believed to have been lured into a trap. Police are worried this might be a murder hunt. But with few firm leads and immediate suspects being ruled out, all the police had to go on was the artist impression of the mysterious Mr. Kipper. Mr. Kipper. Just over a year later, October 1987, a smart young man arrives oh, for an appointment a, a minute ago, 87? at a dating agency 100 miles away in Bristol. A, an appointment at a dating agency, 1987. Okay, I guess this was the 80s, so there was no Tinder or Plenty of Fish or BLK or Christian Mingle or anything like that. I ain't never He's heard well that. presented. He's well groomed. And even the uh, staff who were working at the dating agency said he's attractive, he's got charisma. Financially and career-wise, I've achieved what I've wanted to achieve. Yeah. I'm just now looking for what the next thing to achieve. It's all a charade because he's even using an alias. This is someone who's literally pretending to be another person. What do nasty, dangerous men look like? Well, he was the internet before the internet was even out. Well, they look like this. His real name is John Canan, a man with a very different backstory. Born and raised in Sutton Coldfield near Birmingham, John Canan came from a comfortable background with a doting mother and an ex-RAF father who was a successful car salesman. Privately educated locally, aged 14, John Canan committed his first sexual attack. More followed, culminating in an assault at a local precinct in 1981. John Canan goes into a knitwear shop. The woman is on the phone, and she has her two-year-old son with her weird and he pulls out a knife and puts it to her throat bundles her into the back office and puts it to the the child and said do as you're told or i'll cut him the woman's mother arrives he binds her uh, hand and foot he rapes the woman as her mother stands there saying Please, God, leave her alone. She's pregnant. An absolutely wow. horrendous attack. Police put out a description of the man. There's a distinctive part of his appearance. His eyebrows move. Yeah, them eyebrows is... <laughs> you can't get away from that, really. ...over the bridge of his nose, and within a week, they get a tip off. It's John Canaan. John Canan was jailed for rape. After spending five years in prison, 
he moved to Bristol and enrolled at a dating agency under a false name. John Canan crops up as John Peterson. So not only has he got a brand new name for the purposes Jerry of James. attracting a whole new raft of women, but he's got a whole new history and a whole new personality to go with it. Now, if you join up to a dating agency with a name that's not your own, you're not planning on having a long-term relationship, are you? Financially and career-wise, I've achieved what I've wanted no. to achieve. So he's a Bristol businessman, and he's made his fortune, so he's ready to settle down, spend his time with the right woman. Now, do you admire any famous people after business? Yes, I've admired a few. Um, People like Gandhi. I knew he was gonna say something like this. Gandhi, God, Malcolm X. Philosophers like Bertrand Russell. Uh, present day people like Prince Charles, who's socially aware. But he's kind of overshooting it a bit here. And I see that a lot with psychopathic <clears throat> personalities. He doesn't seem to realize when he takes it too far. But also, classically, he gets words wrong. He's, he's not actually that good with English. And he loves big words and quite often misuses them. I'm just looking now, I'm in a sedimentary period, yeah. where financially and career-wise, I've achieved what I've wanted to achieve. I'm going through a bit of a, a sedimentary period. Sedimentary is a, a geological process by which rocks were formed. Right. What are we talking about? 3.9 billion years ago or so. He might have meant sedentary, but all that means is that you, that you sit down a lot. He probably wasn't trying to convey that impression either. He just gets it completely wrong. I'm just looking now. I'm in a sedimentary period. Now, we call this a malapropism because he's using the wrong choice. If you're in college or you work at 9 to 5 and it's not what you want, it's not making you happy, I seen that um, there's a movie on Netflix where this guy did the same thing and it was like the Onion Dome they, where he took them to the office and they had to solve the murder of himself and somebody was actually trying to take him out and, and he was saying the wrong words playing the role of a, somebody smart. Propism because he's using the wrong choice. And what this signals to us is that this is someone who's literally pretending to be someone else. He's taking on a persona which is much bigger than he is in terms of how socially aware he is or his educational level, if you like. And his language choices are effectively giving him away at this point. We all do this on occasions. I certainly mess up my words all the time. But I think that it's very interesting that some research has shown that people who are very high on psychopathic traits tend to use more malapropisms. And that's because their brain is taxed when they're talking about subjects that they can't emotionally connect to. Mm. When we saw the video from the dating agency, my initial reaction was, this is a man, this is a convicted criminal, a rapist, but he's trying to portray himself as a businessman who has been amazingly successful. Yeah, he's trying to be alluring. He's trying to tell them what they want to hear, basically. He capping. It's a bad cap because of who he really is. It would be good cap if he wasn't really like, you know, if he didn't have that history, but but right now it's terrible. Um, that he, he's financially stable, that he's achieved everything he wants to achieve. These were clearly lies. Now, is there any other country in the world you'd like to live in? Switzerland. But the interview wants to know more. And why, why would that be? It's just a beautiful country. Mm -hmm. It's clean, it's precise. Um, and it's, in, it's a great driving distance it, it, everything. Well, yes, that's right. And what we see is a micro-expression, which is a combination of contempt and immediately after, Fear. Contempt is a unilateral expression. It happens on one side of the face. 
and one corner of the lip will move up to the center of the cheek, activated by what we call a buccinator muscle in the cheek. And that cheek dimpler action is a sign of contemptuous judgment. So why would he feel contempt? Maybe because he's being quizzed on a place he doesn't know too much about. Mm. It's just a beautiful country. Mm -hmm. It's clean, it's precise. I ain't never heard somebody describe a place as precise. That's clearly he don't know what he does. Um. So if you look at his eyes, they've widened. We see the white around the eye. If you look at the eyelids, they're stretched vertically with the top lid high, the bottom lid low. Now, when the mouth moves sideways at the same time, like we're seeing here, activated by the rhizorus muscle connected to the lip corners and the cheekbone, we know beyond reasonable doubt he is experiencing fear. So this charm and intellect seems superficial. He's faking it. Two days after this interview, Kanan reverted to type with a vengeance. He tried to kidnap a woman near the Bristol waterfront, but her screams forced him to run away. But the next day was a different story. Shirley Banks has been married for six weeks. She and her husband, Richard, they have arranged a date night. And she goes into the Broadmead Centre in, in Bristol and selects a blue and white print dress. She makes her way back to her car. A man. I wonder what this kind of face says when they show the dress. Mid. Attacks her and gets into the car with her. She goes missing. Three weeks later, more than 100 miles away in Leamington Spa, police arrest a man after he uses a knife to threaten a shop assistant. His name, John Kinnan. He was brazen too. He was like broad daylight with this, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what, 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 not, maybe sometimes not broad daylight, but people were definitely around and this is possibly visible. And they rapidly find his car and there are handcuffs, a replica gun, and absolutely crucially, a tax disc from Shirley Banks's orange mini. But when police traced that orange mini, it looked very different. Well, John Canan had taken that into his garage, resprayed it, and changed the number plate. And he changed the number plate from HWL 507N to SLP 386S. He chose those letters, and he chose them in that order. The obvious significance is SLP stood for Susie Lamplow. Wow. He collected trophies and putting slick little names on them to really test people, like, ah. Uh -huh. he, he, he felt invisible. Does SLP stand for Susie Lamplow? The only person that can possibly tell us is, of course, John Kanan. 14 months and two weeks earlier, July the 25th, 1986, Wormwood Scrubs, West London. John Canan is completing a five-year jail sentence for rape. As part of his rehabilitation, he's in the prison's day release hostel and has a job locally, but doesn't spend the evenings locked up. There are insecure windows, people get out, and particularly Canan was known to get out at night and he was drawn as if to a honeypot to Fulham, three miles up the road. Wine bar drawn. Locked up, hostel, and has a job. Part of his rehabilitation, he's in the prison's day release hostel and has a job locally, but doesn't spend the evenings locked up. There are insecure windows. What is the, what is the, what is the, like, do y'all not know the main history? This is two separate events now. And y'all give him this type of leeway? I don't care what he does in prison to be so so good and get these type of leisures and whatnot. Like, keep him maxed. Cat A. Those people get out, and particularly Canaan was known to get out at night, and he was drawn as if to a honeypot to Fulham, three miles up the road. Wine bars full of young professional women, 
exactly the sort of woman that he targeted. Kanan completed his sentence for rape and was released. He's come out of Wormwood Scrubs, hostel, uh, on Friday the 25th of July. He's been out three days. That puts it to Monday the 28th of July. That's the day that Susie Lamplew goes missing. Three days after he get out from a halfway house where he wasn't even secure, he commits his next crime. The photo fit of Mr. Kipper, the man seen with a woman who looked like Susie Lamplew on the day she went missing, bore a striking resemblance to John Canaan. After he was jailed for life for the murder of Shirley Banks in Bristol and other violent sexual attacks, officers investigating the Susie Lamplew case questioned John Canaan in prison. They believed the changed car number plate meant an even stronger link to Susie Lamplew. At least they finally got it right at one point. Life. <laughs> Life sentence. Without parole. He said about the car that the car belonged to a Bristol businessman and that he was the man who was responsible for the murder of Susie Lamplew. And I said to him, is that man you, John? And he said, yes. Oh. Then he went, no, no. I meant, it's not me, I'm, I'm backtracked. And we carried on questioning him. Um, and, and he didn't come back to that point. I couldn't get it from him any, anymore. We, we had a break. But I, I actually believe for that very brief moment in time that John Canaan was telling the truth. I don't know whether this is a slip of the tongue or rather a slip of the ego. And you know, you tend not to make mistakes when you're talking about something as serious as murder. The fact that John Canaan said yes, it was enough for me uh, that, that he was a man responsible. You, you can't prosecute somebody for murder on, on one word. But sometimes killers just can't help taking. You can't prosecute somebody for murder on one word. You can if the question is, did you do it? And the word is yes. <laughs> like, what do you mean? That ownership of what they've done, even if it's in a very momentary way, because they are secretly very proud of what they've done. So they want other people to know it, even if it's just for a split second. So it feels to me like it's a very significant moment. It feels to me that it's an admission of guilt. Susie Lamplew's mother, Diana, was convinced John Canaan had killed her daughter. Part of my body has died, been murdered. But it would take a review of Susie's case 14 years after her disappearance before police once again questioned John Canaan. Tapes of the interview in a custody suite were leaked to a national newspaper. Our experts watched the extracts posted online. First, Canaan answers questions about Susie Lamplew. I don't really see, as things currently sound, what else there is to be said. I don't really see, as things currently stand, what else there is to be said. And the, uh, the oh, anger uh, mimic, uh, because I believe this is faked, is on the first part and the second part of the sentence. I don't really see, as things currently sound, what else there is to be said? I'm going to pretend to be angry, but he lets himself down with this instant drop, instant increase, which is not characteristic of anger. He's not feeling anger. And uh, unfortunately for, for him, what he's adding is a qualifier, what we call an exclusion qualifier. As things currently stand. In other words, what you've got me on so far is just circumstantial and therefore I'm not going to give you anything else because I'm feeling fairly secure at the moment. Mrs. Lamplew thinks I've done it. She's accused me of doing it. He uses done it and doing it. So we've got examples of being deliberately ambiguous um, and distancing. It's, it's a little, form of, of even distancing himself. The little things that these people catch on to, like I completely missed when he said done it and doing it. like. The little things that these professionals catch up, like, 
I wonder how it would be being in a relationship with this woman. Just out of curiosity, like, you could not, you got to be faithful, as you should in a relationship. But if you think you're going to cheat on her or lie or do anything behind her back, oh, no. You got another thing coming. Let's see if she got a ring on her finger, man. Let's check it out. Tell from even naming what happened to Susie Lamplew, and we know that Susie Lamplew was murdered. So that's why <clears> we've <throat> got both ambiguous language and distancing happening at that point. I've answered every question you've put to me. I've invited Mrs. Lamplew herself up to the prison, Franklin Prison, to have a quiet word to me, to, to question me, or if her husband wants to question me. And I've said I'll go on the lie detector test, the truth, drug, or anything you want to put me on. And so far, we've not had a denial. Uh, one of the 27 indicators of deception is evasiveness and evasiveness is characterised by not answering a question. Uh, if you didn't do it, you say, I didn't do it. He's not taking that opportunity here. So why is he holding back? John Canan has always maintained that he had nothing to do with Susie Lamplew's disappearance. I'm trying, as I've always tried, for 12 years to try and help you, to try and help persuade you that it wasn't me. Our experts gave their view of this to not help persuade well. All he needed to say was it no. wasn't me. For whatever reason, he qualifies it. He doesn't do that. And he goes to this helping frame. To try and help you, to try and help persuade you that it wasn't me. Why does the it wasn't me come after so much additional packaging? What he's saying is I'm trying and I've been trying for 12 years to convince you that it wasn't me. That is not really a denial. Canaan then said more. It's not me trying to convince somebody that something I could be telling a whole lie. I'm just trying to convince, make you feel like I didn't. More than anyone had expected. To believe my lie. I have committed crime. I've done many things wrong in my life. Um, and things that, believe me, I am genuinely sorry for. Um, one or two things I haven't been caught for. Now, does he realize that that's a stupid thing to say right now? Very stupid. Because what you can see in his eyes is fear. His eyes have widened. You can almost see the whites of the eye. We call that the sclera around the iris and the pupil as we move into a, a micro expression of wide-eyed fear. He's experiencing a fear state. And that could be because he's just semi-confessed by saying, I've committed crimes I haven't been caught for. Um, and things that, believe me, I am genuinely sorry for. Um, one or two things I haven't been caught for. If we unpack this, we have a credibility qualifier, believe me. And then we have... That's how these rappers be in the booth. <laughs> when they <laughs> admitting their crimes over, over rap. They be, yeah, yeah. Chicken stabbed him. <laughs> have interesting language choices. So genuinely sorry for uh, relates to many crimes but not all crimes. So that suggests to me that there are some crimes that he's, he's actually admitting to us on camera that he's not genuinely sorry for. So if he was genuinely sorry for all of his crimes, she got a ring on. why isn't he in that police station right now telling us about those other crimes? One or two things haven't been caught for. He well, part of the reason is he's a criminal and he wants you to do his job. You know, criminality is a game of cat and mouse. You know what I'm saying? Cat being police, mouse being criminals. He knows he's holding information back and there's fear you know, attached. Make, make you work for it. He's already locked up for life, ain't he? So why would there be any fear attached? He's just gonna make it hard for you. To, so. With holding that information back. So this isn't about him easing his conscience at all. This is about him maintaining things that the police haven't yet found out. One or two things haven't been caught for. It's an odd thing to say, isn't it? 
But I think he's trying to bargain with the police. What he's trying to say is, look, I have done terrible things that I've been not caught for, but this isn't one of them. So he's trying to deflect attention away from Susie Lamplew's murder and look like he's actually giving a bit of useful information to the police, look like he's trying to be honest. But actually, all he's trying to do is serve his own needs. Kanan then criticised the police, claiming they had planted stories in the newspapers, blaming him for Susie Lamplew's murder. What you've done? The press gonna be the press, man. The press make their own story, man. Is a dump site more serious than you will ever know? Because you are affecting um, my own position, my own legal position, and you're affecting, quite frankly, my case. I'll be honest with you, I think you're not, that you're not involved in a prosecution, you're involved in a persecution. Which for me is a great line. Um, this is somebody that um, thinks about some of the choices. Um, he... That was a great line. <laughs> if, we, if we're looking at it objectively, that was a great line. <laughs> they... Or non-objectively. ...make in terms of language. But was volume is down. Now, this is someone from most of the interview who has had the volume up, um, and now we get the volumes down. That volume down tends to undermine the words that he's saying at that point. So there's a sense in which that he knows this isn't persecution, and, and this is about the police trying to get to the truth. Though the police wanted Kanan charged, the prosecutor ruled against, wanting more conclusive evidence. Heartbreaking news for Susie's family. We are greatly distressed and indeed considerably angered that after all these years, it is still not possible to prosecute the person who both we and the police believe murdered Susie. The detective who questioned that person, John Canan, more than 30 years ago, still believes he is guilty and will never forget the prime suspect's momentary admission. I think the three main reasons why I think John Canaan uh, is responsible, and he is still the main suspect. Uh, one, he couldn't account for his movements uh, on the 28th of July, satisfactorily to us. The car, the Mini, that he changed that number plate to SLP, I think that's very significant. And thirdly, he said yes to a simple question. <laughs> I don't know, bro. Is it me or is... It be seeming like they got more than enough evidence to get a conviction. They found her car in his garage. Like, they found her car sprayed with a new plate in his, like, possession or somewhere in his possession. Um, will link to him having possession of it. He said yes, I would have, as soon as he would have said yes, I would have, all right, that concludes it, get out, out of there. Like, I, I 35 years on, the Susie Lamplew case remains unsolved and the search continues. Yeah. Uh. In my 25 years of, of policing, this one sticks with me. It, it's not a success of policing. Make that this one, from the policing perspective, it, it's not a success. It's not a success from the, from the policing perspective. We haven't found the body. We haven't found Susie. Uh, we can't give satisfaction to the family. So there's a bit of a sense of failure, I feel, on, on, on our part, on my part, because we weren't able to resolve it. But the answer, the answer to this lies in one man's head. And that's John Canaan. Good morning, Susie Lamplew Trust. Diana and Paul Lamplew worked tirelessly to pull something positive out of the wreckage of this situation, and they created the Susie Lamplew Trust. And the Trust does some remarkable work trying to keep people safe, keep women safe in that's particular, good. and advocating for victims. Silver lining. If there can be one. This is a really heart-wrenching case, and it feels just as relevant now, 35 years on, that it did at the time. 
So I feel as a woman, Susie could have been literally any one of us and is every one of us whenever we feel afraid and unsafe. If John Canan knows anything, anything at all about her disappearance, he's got a moral obligation to tell the police to give her family some sort of... As a, as a perfectly sane person who's on that side of the line, yes, you would think like that. But as John, as that guy, he don't have no moral obligation to do nothing. He's a, he's a M-U-R-D-E-R-E-R. -E -E -R. What morals? Closure, some sort of justice, maybe even bring her body back home. I think that he understands this. I think that he knows this. But if he is responsible, I just don't think that he cares. Does he? Tenth of June, 2017. A 21-year-old man is rushed to the A&E unit. It's a different story. At Bedford Hospital. His name, Alex Skeel. He was found to have second and third degree burns over a number of areas of his um, body. He had stab wounds, scarring, scalding burn marks. Alex tells police the person who's attacked him is his 22-year-old girlfriend, Jordan uh -huh. Worth. Who's Alex? Jordan Worth presents herself as a meek and mild, almost uh, innocent uh, person here where she's trying to project a gentle, meek, mild, vulnerable individual, when the truth is she's an aggressive, violent abuser of a partner. She's just want to sort everything out. Start again. Start again. Yeah. At the surface level, you would think, well, how could she possibly be carrying out this type of abuse against Alex? She went to university. She's got a couple of children seen from a well-mannered background. Well, how possibly could a woman like this be carrying out domestic abuse against a man? It just doesn't seem possible or plausible. And that, that's, the, that's, the, that's, what the, that's what women like this be hiding behind. The thought of, oh man, nobody's gonna think this is possible. Look at, look at how my life has set up. Nah, bro. It could happen to anybody. This could be anybody. Jordan Worth and Alex Skeel had met as teenagers. Jordan Worth was a uh, student who had achieved a degree in fine arts. She had done a large amount of charity work. The couple seemed happy, but the smiles masked the truth. The situation was very different behind closed doors. One of the key features of domestic violence is the Jekyll and Hyde thing. Facing police questions, Jordan Worth tried to give a very different version of events. She was to say to officers uh, that she herself had been the subject um, of violence at the hands of Alex. Um, she did admit um, in due course that she struck him, but she effectively uh, was seeking to downplay the matter to police. As Alex. She's just want to sort everything out. Start again. Start again. She's leaning on the table. Uh, she's got her head cowered, her shoulders are rolled in. She's trying to create a uh, vulnerability in the eyes of, of the police. Start again. Start again. Yeah. yeah. And she closes off this statement. Do you think she's actively trying to do that? Or it's just something that's coming natural to her, like the body's instinct is to do that for her? With some Jekyll and Hyde behavior. What we see here is with the left hand, she grooms the side of her face and uh, takes the hair behind her ear in almost like a, a vulnerable pose. But look at her right hand. You've got the fist firmly clenched on the table. How old are you? 22 and I was 21. Okay. What you were doing? I was holding a knife. And if you notice the rotation of uh, wrist ear, she's clearly mimicking, pointing the knife forward. 
but maybe realizing how aggressive this might look, she very quickly softens it off and turns it back and places her hand on the desk here. So she's reliving the moment, but hang on a minute, this is looking too bad, I'll soften off and bring back to the table. Your son is into coming house. So she's trying to describe a vicious attack with a knife in a light-hearted way, and we are- I guarantee you she's an only child too. Of a gentle, social smile on her face, almost trying to take the emphasis away from what was a vicious attack. I was holding a knife. Your son is into coming house. There's laughter when she says the house and the volume drops. If we put those two things together, I was holding the knife. I got a friend that's in a relationship like this right now. I just wanted him to come in the house means that her motivation, according to Worth, for holding the knife was to get Alex to come in. So one of the first questions we'd want to ask is, why does she need a knife in order to get Alex to come in the house? Tell me about the knife. Oh, it was a big one uh, in the kitchen. I think it was a bread knife. I'm not actually sure. It's at this point we see an increase in hesitation and pauses, which is a sign um, of stress, potentially. It's also indicative of deception in some cases. Tell me about the knife. Oh, it was a big one uh, in the kitchen. I think it was a bread knife. And it was a big one. So we can assume she chose a big one from the ki uh, kitchen and she thinks it's a bread knife. So in, in spite... I'm gonna keep it a buck with y'all right now. I'm gonna keep it real. I don't even know the difference between kitchen knives. All I know is butter knife and knife. That's it. Of her demeanor, in spite of how she says this, that's quite a menacing thing to do. She's asked... So how far do you think the knife went in? So now we know it's menacing. Um, it's, a, it's a loaded question. I don't think it went that far, but it did, there was a lot of There was a lot of blood. She's admitting she's caused Alex harm, but she isn't telling us she's attacked him. She's telling us she was holding the knife that then ended up in him, and then it, it didn't go in that far. Notice she doesn't say she didn't put it in that far. She then contradicts herself, of course, because she tells us there was a lot of blood, so it would suggest it went in far enough to cause quite a serious injury. Jordan Worth seems quite compliant in her police interviews. She's trying she really, to show that... She really does. Like, she's being cooperative. She's sitting forward, she's paying attention, and she's answering the questions. Look, if you're ambitious, trying, you're young, you want to make money... She's trying to seem overly helpful. She's trying to use that, uh, that privilege. There's multiple privileges she could be using, but right now she's using the one that is, you know, indicative of the situation. Big word. But what I find quite disturbing is the fact that even though she wants to minimize what she's done to Alex, she's actually quite matter of fact. She seems to have lost all sense of perspective that this is absolutely inappropriate, unacceptable behaviour. It shows what has become the norm for them in their household. Pretty soon after their relationship started, she began to control um, and suggest what he wore. She wanted him to wear clothes that were made by Jack Wilkes because it was the same initials as her name. As it progressed, she would um, effectively end up taking over his Facebook profile. Um, and shutting down his contacts. Also... Yeah, my boy is in the same type of relationship. I don't know if it's getting better, but... <laughs> they probably watching. Hey, you got him hemmed up. Let him loose. Jordan Worth insisted on the colour of Alex's clothing and forbid him from wearing anything in grey. Domestic abuse is very insidious. It's a drip, drip, drip of behaviours. And those first behaviours Jordan Worth telling Alex that he doesn't really suit some colours, so he should wear another colour instead. They, they seem to be almost caring. A lot of them are packaged as romance. Well, I only get possessive because I really, really... Ooh, bad, looks like a backwards compliment. ...love you. 
It's a whole pattern of behaviours, a whole raft of different behaviours designed to manipulate a victim and make that victim dependent on somebody. And they think, well, yes, because this person loves me so much, don't they, that this must be right. And then they try and alter their behaviour to try and avoid there being any unpleasant consequences in the future. Now, of course, they, they find that they can't avoid unpleasant consequences, and so they feel helpless, they feel trapped, and they feel stuck in this situation that they just can't get out of. Eventually, Alex Skeel did decide he'd had enough of Jordan's control, and he ended their relationship after two years together. But when Jordan gave birth to Alex's child, they reunited and eventually moved to a new address in Stewartby, Bedfordshire. He became cut off from his friends and his family. He became captured, completely captured and controlled by Jordan so that he had no independence, no means of escape. Despite the arrival of a second child, the abuse continued. On June the 3rd, 2017, Bedfordshire police are alerted. Neighbours had called them to say that they felt that his life was actually at risk. Police arrived at one o'clock in the morning. Uh, they could see that um, Alex um, had a number of very serious injuries. Um, at that stage, Alex was indicating to police that he had self-harmed and they were self-inflicted. Still trying to protect her. One officer recorded the scene on his body camera. The body cam footage that we see is really quite... It's a mess. ...harrowing viewing. It's painful viewing because you see just how broken Alex is. And even though he's got a policeman standing in front of him, He's too afraid to say, yes, she's doing this to me, please help me. And so he goes along with the pretense that in actual fact, he's a self-harmer and he's doing this to himself. That shows you just how powerful a figure Jordan Worth is to him. With no complaint from Alex Skeel, the police made no arrests. He was left at home with Jordan Worth, but things would change dramatically. Hey. Sunday, hey, June the 10th, 2017. One week after police visit the home of... If there's anybody going through any domestic situations on, on either side of the fence, man, do not... If, listen, it does not get better. It only gets worse. You need to separate. You need to call whatever hotline you need to call. You know, call your parents. Get help. You ain't got to deal with it by yourself. Good help. Mm. Alex Skeel and his partner, Jordan Worth, a second emergency call is made. Can we not show any type of... I mean... The thing for me is that Alex's neighbours saved his life. Facts. Police spoke to Alex, this time privately. Um, and that then started the police investigation into the matter. So, well, Alex, you want to come and have a chat with me? We'll go upstairs. But at first, Alex insists there's no problem. Have you been to or anything like that? No, 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 nothing. It's just an argument. We're just so stressed out. Are you 100% sure, Alex? Eventually, the officer persuades Alex to make a... Alex don't even look like the same man in the pictures that we were seeing. Statement, just as Jordan enters the room. To get Alex away from Jordan, the police tell her they're taking him to hospital. Alex was taken to hospital. And finally confirmed the officer's suspicions. I just don't want to get hurt anymore. Jordan Worth was taken to the police station, but tried to downplay evidence of Alex's injuries. I think the ghost fucked my husband. <laughs> Bad 
about this hairbrush? Of Alex's injuries. Tell me about this hairbrush that you keep in the car. Well, whenever we've had an argument in the car, I'll wrap just my hairbrush so it's inside and I'll just sort of pet him either wherever I can. What she's trying to do is minimise her actions by saying just my hairbrush. I'll wrap just my hairbrush and sort of hit him wherever I can. I'll just sort of pet him. So she's using vague language when she says, um, I'll just sort of fit him wherever I can, it shows intent. We've had an argument, happens more than once. My go-to is to pick up the hairbrush that is on the side and I'll just sort of hit him. It suggests it's an activity that she's engaged in definitely more than once and probably regularly. And they got a newborn child that's subject to, you, you, you think these kids don't ingest what they see at such a young age, but they do, believe me, they do. I got a child. They take all of that in, man. Next, so there were well questions another. about a much more serious attack. So we have an interesting confession here because uh, the discussion now is around worth pouring boiling water over Alex often while he's sleeping in bed, uh, boiling water. And uh, we've seen different. the results of that in terms of the scarring of the tissue uh, on his arms and, uh, and around his back. And it was so bad, he screamed. Never leaves, never. So she, she uses head shakes and says, never in Leeds, but she falters on never. Never in Leeds, never. Never in Leeds, And she repeats never again, which suggests it's undermining what she's just said. There's a lack of confidence in what she's saying. She's trying to reassure herself with the double never. So she didn't say, I didn't pour water on him. Uh, she's saying here, uh, yes, I do pour boiling water on him, but you've got it wrong, not in Leeds. Uh, very, very weird. He says that he's told to make a story up to tell your parents that the shower in the hotel was faulty. Yeah, right. You know how much money I'd sue that hotel for if it was burning me like that? Come on now. Y'all be rich. And there were scars from another attack, from another serious weapon. When Jordan Worth mentions the hammer in the police interview, we have more evidence of vague language. There was a hammer. She tells us there was a hammer, and then she pauses, sh she hesitates, um, pauses again, and then tells us, but I never, I never hurt him. That's what she's telling. Does she think he feels no pain or something? Like, what? She knows is that she didn't hurt a him too much. A hammer hurt. Much. Not that she didn't hurt him with the hammer. I think she did more. Uh, and we obviously did more because he had marks all over the place. And you've accepted that you have thrown water over him yeah. that was boiling. Yeah. Okay. And you have accepted that you swiped him with the knife yeah. and cut him. Yeah. All right. And the other times we just maybe like. But you can't argue about those injuries because they're quite obvious because yeah. the burn marks and the cuts. Yeah. Okay. Finally, there was the claim that you. Look at this man. This man looks over... Let me move out the way, because y'all not getting a full grasp of this picture right here. Look at this man. This man looks so peaceful in a hospital bed. Oh, wherever he is at, he looks peaceful right now. While somebody probably in the kitchen plotting boiling water Some stuff Jordan had stopped Alex from seeing his parents Alex seems relieved that he's now going home back to his family that man gonna have PTSD forever he feels he's been isolated from 
Isolating a victim from their friends and family is very, very common amongst domestic abusers because they don't want to be found out. They don't want their partner to have the support network to be able to go to and potentially leave them. He states that the majority of the contact with his family has been stopped because you... You hear that? I'm going to send this to you. You hear that? Stopped him having contact. Mm. And also, they're jealous of the relationships that their partners have with other people. They want to create a world where it's just them and their partners, because that way they've got far more control. Would you say at any point you have made it difficult for him to see his friends or family? Mm. Mm. He made it very clear he didn't want to see any of his family. He said he hated his family. Delusionability. I made that word up. I don't know if that's real. Delusional. To his family. He wasn't supposed to his family. At the root of this appears to be morbid jealousy. And what I mean by that is not just the green-eyed monster, but a real pathological fear that somebody is going to come in and take her man. That's the paradox of domestic abuse. So you've got these people who exert so much power and control over their partners, but that doesn't make them powerful individuals. They might be dominant individuals, they might be very bullying individuals, but at the heart of it, they're actually really very inadequate. It stems from their lack of self-worth and self-esteem and the inability to believe that actually somebody could just love them for them and want to stay with them without them having to make sure for that real. happens by being controlling, threatening, intimidating. Jordan Worth pleaded guilty to causing grievous bodily harm with intent and was the first woman in the UK to be guilty of the new offence of coercive control. She was jailed for seven and a half years. Not all as, as she should be. domestic abuse involves physical violence. And so coercive control has now been made into an offence to recognise that. It might involve threats, it might involve intimidation. In this case, it involved isolating Alex from his family, taking his wallet away from him not allowing him to go to work, not allowing him to sleep in the bed, not even allowing him to eat when he needed to eat. So all of this has an accumulative... This Alex, this is not the same dude that we saw when the police came. ...effect of making him feel helpless, hopeless, and utterly, utterly dependent. I'm glad you up out of there, Alex. Your kid probably with you, and she is in jail currently, probably. Because that was in 2007, 2018, 2017, 2018. So, TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe. Turn on your post notification. If you are in any, if you're in a situation like this or know anybody in a situation like this, help them.